guys, I want to welcome you to the weekly Wednesday for the Financial Freedom Newsletter, where every week, every Wednesday, we delve into something inspirational, motivational, something excerpt taken from the Financial Freedom Weekly Newsletter. Wherever you are, if you're listening on Spotify, on iTunes, Google, be sure to click the like, subscribe, share, comment. Without ado, let's get into the show. Welcome, everybody, to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom Podcast. And I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. As you know, I talk about four different types of freedom, time, financial, location, health freedom. And in that light, I'm always scouring the globe, looking for entrepreneurs on the cutting edge, changing the world, making impact. So today, we're going to talk all about marketing, branding, customers, and business growth. And so today we have Stephanie Real, and she dubs herself, she's the top 40 under 40 entrepreneur. She's a brand strategist, uh, marketing consultant, and uh, she's been an entrepreneur for 13 years, and she's a founder and mentor. So it's going to be a fantastic discussion. And with that, uh, I'll welcome her, Stephanie to the show. Welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Yes, uh, I know we had connected through Podmatch, which is like the Airbnb of uh, podcasting. And <laughs> I love it. <laughs> try to, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, like I said, you know, you're a great fit for the audience because you know they were, they're interested in marketing, branding, digital marketing. So tell us more about your story, your company, and how you got started. Absolutely, I actually started my first business as a side hustle at the age of 22, so I didn't have any traditional marketing experience. Um, but uh, I had done some some work in marketing to at that point uh, with a senior in college and was sitting in my first real marketing class and it just clicked. I loved the balance of storytelling. Um, and I, I did a lot of that. I was a journalism undergrad um, and I did a lot of that and I loved that piece of marketing. I loved the data and analytics and especially for those of you who are listening um, with that science mind, you know, it, it 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 can be really black and white when you're looking at the data. You can clearly understand if something is resonating with the audience or not. And I loved that with marketing, a little bit of psychology, understanding consumer behavior, because it's not just let's pick our favorite color and run with it. There's a lot of intention that we that goes into branding and, and branding um, to your ideal customer. And so that's that really lights me up. And um Gosh, it feels like ages ago at this point, but I guess it was 13 years ago, almost 14 years ago, where I started my first business and took that from a side hustle. I was working for other companies during my, you know, nine to five hours and then spending nights and weekends building my business, working with clients, did that for nine years. And then in 2019, I left my full-time job, left corporate, um, left a, a really, you know, a comfortable salary and all the great benefits and have went full in on being a, a full-time entrepreneur and and really um, focusing on my business and clients full-time. And I haven't looked back. So here we are. It's awesome. Uh, it's, it's so amazing to hear all these stories coming out of the pandemic and, you know, people uh, finally woke up and, you know, decided to pursue their dreams. They you know, we only have one life to live. And um, it's great to, you know, so many of my friends who are entrepreneurs, they're just killing it and really just the power of focus. And if you decide, so, you know, like I said, you're a, you're a, you know, full blown entrepreneur uh, marketing. And so you talk about analytics and data, which is really interesting. I, I love marketing too. And then tell us uh, three data points your small business should be tracking. Oh my goodness. There are way more than three, but I think if we can only start with three, one of the tools that I talk about a lot with my small business clients, um, and it it can be a, a missed opportunity, is all the data that comes through Google Analytics. So um, it's a free tool. If you have a website or any kind of a, a um, URL that you're using and driving traffic to, there's no reason you shouldn't have that set up. And one of the things that I love to dig into there is your customer's engagement with the content on the page. So you can use behavior tracking um, and, and go through in Google Analytics. So you're going deeper, a level deeper than your site traffic or your number of sessions. But what are people doing when they get to the site? Where are they leaving? Where are they exiting and jumping off the page, going somewhere else? 
Where are they digging in and seeing more? And that's when we can really understand what our consumers interested in. So that's for sure one of those. And so that's um, the behavior data. And then um, one of the other big misses, you know, I think when we talk about email marketing, I truly believe that uh, no matter what the naysayers say, it's not dead. I think it's a really strong tool. It's one of the best converting tools still out there for small businesses. Um, but I think so often as a small business, owner, you think, oh, what are my open rates doing? But it's so much more than that again. And, and we're going to hit a little bit of a theme here. I want to know how your audience is engaging with that content. So open rates, great. But depending on what email platform you're sending to, if it's Outlook versus Gmail, it, it counts that email as an open sometimes before the customers actually even o- literally open the email and read it. If it just hits their servers, it pings back as an open. So that's not really a great metric for us to know what's happening with an email. And one of the ones that is, is your click-through rate or your click rate in an email. So if you're sending out a campaign, yes, you wanna have an eye on the open rate, but more so click-through rate for email because that's gonna show you how people are engaging and finding your email once they're receiving it and actually truly opening it, not just it hitting a server and saying that it's an open. So that's the second. You know, I think for a small business, especially when we're looking at social media. I don't want you to look at likes. I I could care less how many likes you get on on a post because I think that that's an arbitrary. We call those vanity metrics. And so yes, likes are great. They make us feel all warm and fuzzy. They give us a dopamine hit, but they don't actually do anything to keep the lights on for your business. (laughs) And so I always like to see referral traffic again, going back to Google Analytics or if you're using like Wix or Squarespace or Shopify or another platform, they'll have those native analytics um, within that platform too, where you can get some of this data. So look at referral traffic. What are my top performing? Where's the majority of my traffic coming from? And if it is on social media, where where are people coming from and how much time on site are they spending once they're getting there too? So you should be able to track all of those and you really start to get a pulse of your customer how they're finding you, how long they're staying when they're with you, and what content they're engaging with the most. And I think that those three pieces are critical to do all of those and so much more. It's funny you mentioned the vanity metrics because when I was getting st- when I was getting started, you know, I just wanted to build a following, so I was always, um, you know, I was always about the followers, how many followers, how many, and then, um, <laughs> and I realized that um, there's actually an inverse correlation, like the engagement and the monetization is actually you have less engagement, but you have more, but more money was coming in. Whereas in the beginning you had more engagement, but then there was like no, no revenue. So it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of, ironic. absolutely. but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, but uh, so, and then, you know, with so much, uh, you know, so much platforms, you know, people can, you know, basically people can create the audience I know you know this, but, you know, for the audience, like it's just getting started. What's the best social platform for my business, for any business to be active on right now? I know it depends, but I just wanted to put that out for the listeners. Well, and hey, listeners, depending on (laughs) what kind of personality you are, you're either going to love my response or you're going to hate it. (laughs) Because the reality is the best social media platform for you to be on is the one you're going to be consistent on, the one you're going to show up on. If you're not a TikTok person, I am not here to tell you, you have to be on TikTok. I'm not even on TikTok because I couldn't do it consistently, right? So uh, for me personally, that answer is going to look different than it is for you, Christopher. It's going to look different for everybody. But I think the thing is just like a workout regimen or a diet. What's going to work best for you is what is going to work for your lifestyle. What's going to work for you consistently? Or if you do have maybe a VA or some kind of an assistant helping you post here and there, it, that has to be a layer of it to know what's going to work best for you and your team or your resources. The second piece is where your audience actually is. And so that is where it's going to change depending on what you're, what you're looking to build and who you're speaking to. Um, the data is very clear for different age ranges, who is more active where, and that's just, that's just the, the lay of the land when it comes to social media. If you have a younger audience, 30 and younger, you're looking at Snapchat, TikTok, maybe a little bit Instagram still, but, but even aging out of Instagram there. Um, if you have a more mature audience, an old millennial, which I can say because I am one, um, or, you know, through 45, 50, even aging up a little bit from there as well. Instagram, Facebook, 
um, and really playing with LinkedIn too, depending on the kind of content you have. But I think beyond anything, we could talk about every platform and what it's good for today. But if you're not going to be consistent, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's why I was I I, I knew the, <laughs> but I just wanted to because it's you know it really depends on you know who yeah, your customer is. Absolutely. Did. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting how the uh, trends because like Facebook came out with Facebook Reels and they're trying to make it kind of like a Instagram for adults. And um, what's interesting is that you have, uh, you it looks like uh, you have this interest in Pinterest marketing. I, I always, I didn't have much success. So I just stopped, you know, like you said, you know, what what's your cup of tea, but uh, tell us like kind of the difference between Pinterest and uh, Instagram. Oh, I love talking about Pinterest because I think it's such a missed opportunity. A lot of people think, oh, I have to have recipes or I have to be an influencer or a fashionista to be on Pinterest. And uh, actually, Pinterest is the top social media driver for a lot of our B2B clients and my own marketing services. We're using Pinterest. And the beautiful thing about Pinterest, it, it's very different than other social media. I really refer to it as social search. So it's a lot more like a Google than it is like a Facebook or an Instagram. It's keyword centric and it is all based on links. Um, the other thing, and I have to mention this because it makes it brings me joy to share this. Unlike other social platforms, which have been known to um, make people feel maybe depressed or low or, or have negative side effects, people are planning for the future on Pinterest. So it actually is a very positive platform. People are happy to be there. And so I think that that is a big difference maker. If you can get a hang of, of Pinterest, and I actually believe in Pinterest so much, um, I think everybody should be using it for their business. So I developed a very easy to use, um, scalable solution for content. And I have a course that's like a fraction of what you would cost to pay somebody to do it. But it teaches you how to take, say, one blog post and turn it into 300 different pins for your brand and, and how to do that over and over again. Um, before I get too off on a tangent, I think the other thing to keep in mind is, and what I love for Pinterest is... Some of our best performing content there that continues to drive traffic for clients and for our own business are pins that we've done four and five years ago. So the cool thing for you entrepreneurs listening or want to be budding up entrepreneurs that are maybe living the side hustle life, you post it once, it's going to work for you for years to come. And I'm not just making it up. I could pull up actual analytics data and show you some of our best performing pins, even for some clients who we're no longer working with their best performing content is still content that we did for them four and five years ago. So um, I always like to stretch my, my effort or my dollar as long as I can. And Pinterest is a great platform to do that on for sure. Yeah. It's interesting because you're talking about residual attention, residual views, and, it, and it's really, that's like where your customers are. Um, you know, some of the very interesting platforms are like Pinterest, there's Tumblr, which is kind of like Twitter a little bit, and then like um, Substack, um, which are really kind of like, um, so basically go where your audience is. But, um, you know, on the subject of Pinterest, um, I know a lot of um, the audience and listeners out there, because um, you talk about the science behind branding using color psychology, and what is kind of the science and driver behind branding and how to get pe how to get customers to convert? So I, I think that would be a whole, we could spend a whole <laughs> discussion on branding. Um, but I, I think a lot of times I see small businesses when they're just starting out, you know, you have to put together the brand or they think they do. And I think before, if you don't know who your audience is, we can't even talk about branding. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that first, because I think we can get ahead of ourselves sometimes. And oftentimes I see a, a newbie entrepreneur getting so stuck on branding when, oh my gosh, I don't know what my color should be or my font, but because they don't even know who they're talking to. And so you have to know who your audience is, what problem you solve for them and your offer before you can even look at branding. But the cool thing with branding and how I am no, I am by no means a doctor, but I get to play scientists a little bit at this point, because once we know your audience, your offer, and the transformation you're going to help that audience achieve with your product or service, we can layer on intentionally with colors and fonts that help subliminally tell the brain about what your brand offers them. So like, for example, the color blue. I'm sure you can think of a couple of brands right now, even some brands we've already talked about on uh, in our conversation so far today, things like Facebook, 
Twitter, LinkedIn, they're all blue. A lot of big banks, PayPal is blue. Visa has blue in the logo. Um, blue is interpreted by our brains to be very trustworthy, very reliable, very secure. Um, and majority of people prefer the color blue. It's not it's not a standoffish color where it um, might isolate somebody in the audience. So you see a lot of brands using blue because of the feeling that it evokes. And so, um, and I can go through this with the whole color wheel, but that would take up all of our time and we can talk about anything else. Um, same thing with fonts though. Similarly, there are certain fonts that our brain reads them to be more modern, like a sans serif font versus a script font, which is going to come off maybe a little bit more delicate or nurturing or feminine. Um, and so really, depending on your audience, you can really intentionally craft how they feel when they first impression of your brand before you actually even tell them what you do by the colors you choose and the fonts you use. So it really shouldn't be your favorite color that you're using for your branding. Yeah, that's uh, like a, like branding is like this whole other topic and you know it's like um you know what constitutes a brand um how do you stand out you know what's your competitive like you know like all these you know nike starbucks you know all these they understand like how to get into the consumer awareness mindset you know how to capture how and that's actually you know social media is like capturing attention and how to cultivate attention and um so really interesting uh as we get to the end of this um we're near the end of this talk um one thing is that you have advice for people considering becoming entrepreneurs um you know some of your best advice or tips and things you wish you hadn't done and and tips on going all in man such a good question you know i think i don't i don't look at failure the way a lot of people do i don't i i learn from it and i quickly move forward and i think that that's one thing that i see my relationship with failure has really evolved in the last 13 years and being an entrepreneur. I mean, when I was 22, I was fearless. I didn't think twice. I, um, you know, I just, I went for it. And I think the older that we get, you know, and we've had maybe um, an experience where it didn't go quite the way that we thought, we can let that paralyze us. But I think that as an entrepreneur, you have to learn how to push through, learn the lesson and quickly move forward because otherwise you can, it, it can detract a whole lot more than just your mindset. It can, it can, really make a big impact for your business too. So I think that that's one thing. I do a lot of mentorship work with um, entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs or, or students that want to go into business. And and we talk about mindset and, and failure a lot because I think that, that can we can get in our own way. And that's one of the things I see um, entrepreneurs do early on their journey, for sure. Um, you know, and I think the one thing going from being a solopreneur and side hustle into doing it full time, that's a totally different way of approaching business. And um, I learned it the hard way. I, I learned doing things differently. But I think one of those pieces with that was knowing when to delegate and when was the right time to outsource, even if it's something small, if you're just starting out, you know, I did my own bookkeeping and accounting for the business for 11 years. Why did I do that? I am not an accountant. I didn't even like accounting in school. Like it was, <laughs> but you know, to save a buck and to, to learn it, to know what was going on and to understand my books, it was important for me to, to have that hands-on experience. Could I have delegated that out sooner? Yes. And I am really glad I have a bookkeeper now who helps me keep track of everything and we can keep a pulse on financials. But I think, you know, that was one of those lessons that I learned the hard way that I, I could have delegated that sooner or maybe even brought in like a virtual assistant, a VA or or someone to support me on some of the less revenue generating things for the business, maybe admins, scheduling for the cal my calendar and manage helping managing the email inbox or client communication and and those different pieces that are important to business, of course, but maybe you aren't the person that needs to do it. And so that would be another um, it seems so simple to say, but it's often when we're starting out, it's often overlooked. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many tips and, uh, you know, I, I wish I could be in my twenties too. Cause I was, I was so fearless. I didn't, I didn't care. And I, you know, I just go for it. And now it's like, you're kind of, you've, you've seen everything. So you, you know, you're a little bit more wary and, but, uh, that's why I admire the, um, the Gen Z and the Gen Alphas. And I, I just tell Me them too. to because, uh, you know, they, they have their whole life ahead of them. So the, uh, so yeah, really interesting, you know, really valuable advice, um, especially like marketing and branding. And, um, so to, 
you know a lot of the audience out there you know could be of the female cohort you know they want to be entrepreneurs how can they follow you contact you uh, visit your socials etc yeah i am at real deal everywhere so it's r i e l d e a l um and then you can also find me at stephaniereal.com which will also get you to all those social channels yeah and for all the listeners out there be sure to check out uh, stephanie's um resources um her website and she's also all she's on all social media stephanie real uh, be sure to check that out and thanks so much for dropping so much uh, alpha and nuggets of wisdom and thanks for coming onto the podcast yeah thanks for having me it was great to be here today i hope you really enjoyed that wonderful inspirational motivational piece again if you wherever you are listening if you liked it be sure to like comment share subscribe we're on everywhere spotify itunes google amazon audible and without much ado be sure to thank this show's sponsors and we'll see you next